Hello and welcome to the Bossit Podcast. My name is Mark Edwards, and as always, we're going to be speaking to somebody from within the software technology sector. Today, we're going to be speaking to Leon Cooperman from Cast AI, who is Chief Technology Officer. So, Leon, welcome to Bossit. Hey, Mark. Thank you so much for having me. Let's start out. Give, give us a quick summary. Tell us a little bit about your background, and then I want to really talk about Cast AI, because there's a number of questions that I've got that I think might be of interest to some of the listeners as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been in this industry for 25 years, an engineer by trade. I started coding at a very early age. I loved it. I mean, this was really a I tell my wife, like, if, if engineering didn't pay well, we would be in the poorhouse because I'd still, be still do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, good. Love it. So, you know, I kind of started my journey right out of school. Like I got an internship at IBM, really didn't like big corporate environments and kind of followed my family footsteps in entrepreneurship. And I've basically been doing small companies, uh, small software companies and startup space for the last 25 years with the exception of kind of the bookends of IBM in the early days. And then Oracle just recently, uh, the company was acquired by Oracle. And then, so I spent uh, w- what I thought would be a difficult time over kind of a three-year period it turned out to be a really interesting and I learned a lot. It was a great experience so I, and I learned a ton. So, and then I'm kind of back into startup life now with Cast, but that whole journey has been really an entrepreneurial journey. What did you learn for your, with your time at IBM? Because I know my experience, I've, I've met and, and had conversations with a lot of people from IBM. It's a big organization. When you look back on it now, what did you learn? So I didn't know anything back then, right? Like, so I was just eager kid. I, I think I was like, I started at when I was 19 or 20, like in that range, right? Like I was still literally going to classes and right. DJing at night. That was my part-time job. And so I came in with wa- eyes wide open and a very kind of common sense attitude towards let's figure out what customers are asking for and then just do that really quickly and then forget it. And I didn't even concern myself with the politics because I was working so quickly that I think by the time anyone had a chance to complain about me, I was already like on to the next <laughs> so, so I was I was a founding developer of a thing called uh, IBM WebSphere Commerce Suite. This was early days. This was like Lou Gerstner was still the CEO. IBM had just kind of gone through a really interesting dip in the late 90s. And there was like really a question of its long-term survival. And we had done this little startup within a massive company. It wasn't supposed to go anywhere but we launched LL Bean online and Lou Gerstner gets like a case of champagne from the CEO of LL Bean. And that was it. Like we literally funded the little five person startup within this juggernaut by making a customer successful. And that's the key. That's the key insight. Customers are successful. Nothing else matters. Yeah. Yeah. I think that one, one thing that you said actually that reminded me, and it was a conversation I was having recently, is software companies that have started out with this principle of listening to their customer as to what they want and have created it and found out, actually, they didn't really want that at all. Do you know what I'm yes. talking about there? <laughs> oh, it's, if you ask customers what they want, they will ask for a better mousetrap. Like you, yes. you have to be very careful in those conversations. It's a triangulation. You have yes. a vision towards a significant industry pain. Yeah. You talk to customers about that pain. They might tell you in high, hey, I wish we had X, right? but you have to, that's, the, that's the, the secret sauce. You have to be able to extrapolate that conversation and say, okay, well, Really, in order to have a quantum leap or a zero to one event, we need to overcome this legacy thinking and bring the customer to. I have this conversation all of the time where we get on a demo with a prospect and I've had comments like, I didn't know I needed your software until I saw it in operation. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Like my initial impression is I need none of this, right? But now that I see it, I'm not sure I can I want to move forward without it. That, 
And that's yes. what, that's the that's the quantum leap you need to get to as an entrepreneur. I had a client that had been working with it was five or six customers for a period of between six and eighteen months in depth creating the solution that they said they wanted it was coming towards the end of that period and my big concern was were they going to actually move forward and none of them did and it nearly destroyed the business what were they actually writing code mark were they was they were the, okay they well were. i think that's yeah. a cardinal sin yeah like in that investigative if you're writing code for 18 months yeah. You're taking a huge, like, let's say that's a team of five or six people. Do the math on the money you've just spent. Oh, I, I, You have to be way leaner to be yeah. successful in, in software these days. I don't think that the, the, the end user, why should we expect them to be the innovator, the creator? I think, you know, we, we have to go. We talking about myself as a, a, a software vendor, but you know, the, the industry needs to be able to be the experts you you don't go to see your doctor and then start suggesting to him what prescription you're going to take you he's the expert but you do need to get an understanding of what they're looking to achieve and maybe some of the issues that they've currently got within their business so there is a balancing act isn't there yeah the the customer is amazing at two points of validation from my perspective yeah. Where is the pain? And they can describe the pain without describing a preferred solution, right? Like, yes, right? So the pain is the most important insight. And then once you believe that you've got an answer to that pain, showing them early and often, mock-ups, Figma, like wh whatever you can show them to validate that validate. the path you're yes. taking is going to be a solution to their pain. And what are those objections? So there are, there are a couple of classes of objections. There's what I call the real objection. And then there's the organizational, oh, security would never approve this. You know, oh, we can't do this kind of SaaS business. Well, those are fluffy objections. You can just discard them. But the, you know, you're looking for the mechanical objection that really stops what you perceive the solution to be from working in the long term. Yes. Do you know, I, I believe that actually the soft, when, when software companies run into this type of problem, it's only their fault. I don't believe that it is the fault of the user because quite often when I've spent time with these companies that you can see that are continually falling into this trap, there are gaps in their process and the customer is then filling those gaps and taking control. And the most successful companies have their processes laid out where they're, they're able to understand the pain, able to test often and validate. And I think that the user then has confidence that they're in the hands of a professional who really knows what they're doing. When there's, well, what do you want me to do next sort of approach, which some people do when in an attempt to sell, I think it causes lots of problems. Yeah, and it's a, that's a pro services, professional services business. You know, yeah. you're building as a consultancy software that the customer is giving a specification for, it. and there's there's nothing wrong with that business model other than no. its gross margin. But that's not a software innovation business. That's no. not where you're going to get massive changes to industry and multiples uh, on your return of of effort. No, no, and it's a good point to make. We're not talking about that, you know, professional services type of business. You know, we're, we're talking more about the sort of the potentially the SaaS type of business that we're talking about. So you mentioned about also a business that you were in being acquired by Oracle. Tell us a little bit about that. What, what business was that? Yeah, absolutely. So and by the way, just so like, Mark, if you notice kind of like in my journey, the next business that I kind of envision or dream up isn't necessarily a just the out of the blue, hey, I want to go solve problem X. It's usually a pain that I myself personally have felt and have been so frustrated by the industry. And I've already done the deep research for myself to realize there is no adequate solution. So I why why not fill that space if I'm passionate about it? Right. So the the key insight I had was back in the 2000, kind of 12, 2011, I was the victim of a, my business was the victim of a cyber attack, a cyber security attack. I was working for a large retailer in on the West coast of the United States. And I had 
what I thought I had a, a seasoned security team and tools and Akamai as a vendor and all kinds of things. When this cyber, it was a d distributed denial of service attack that came in for ransom of 5,000 US dollars to, uh, to the, wire, the money was to be wired to Siberia, but they weren't using Bitcoin for the ransom piece yet. Right. To put that in perspective, that $5,000 was bringing my business down, which was hovering in the 750,000 to $1 million a day in sales range. So literally a million dollars a day was being suppressed by a $5,000 ransom. Wow. And my CEO didn't want to negotiate. His statement was, we don't negotiate with terrorists. And I was forced to kind of solve this problem. And I muddled through it. I ended up paying the ransom. So I failed basically. And I ended up paying the ransom. And then the this this cyber criminal basically said the most audacious thing on I, I could ever imagine. He sent me an email saying, "Thank you very much for your payment. Uh, are there any of your competitors that you'd like us to attack? We're going to throw in two for free." And I'm like, wow. "This is the most ludicrous business model that these criminals have come up with." And and then from then on, I was kind of determined to stop. These types of cyber attacks. It started with distributed now of service, but it. Sorry, go ahead, Mark. I, I was just going to say, I'm, I, I'm assuming because of your background and what you were doing, this was quite a sophisticated attack. This this wasn't something that was, you know, just very simplistic. That they were quite sophisticated in what they were doing. Yes and no. I mean, my yeah. level of of cybersecurity, what I thought I knew and what I what I knew, like. I have very strong background in encryption and payment security standards, but the simple problem of discerning a robot from a human on the web is non in a non-invasive way is a non-trivial computer science problem. And so there were some standard tools out there. They were very primitive. And the, I would say that that attacker's level was like, I've seen much more sophisticated since then. Sure. But these were these were early days where no one really understood distributed the balance uh, service. Okay. Yes. And so we started this company called Zen Edge uh, after that e-commerce. Uh, after I finished that with that e-commerce business, we started this uh, company called Zen Edge. It was uh, self-funded at first uh, with with friends and family. We ended up going through that whole growth life cycle, and yes. here was the key insight: because we were a SaaS startup, we wanted to offer this service this cybersecurity service in the cloud only, we deployed everything in AWS, all right. data centers of AWS and our bill <laughs> is growing exponentially month over month. So yeah. every month I would have like this very uncomfortable conversation with my CEO. And the truth is I didn't know how to solve the cost problem. So every time we would get a big customer, I would just brace myself. And we went through all of those kind of Alcoholics Anonymous. We went, went through denial and then rage, and then we tried to build our own data centers. And then, so I think we did, we did a pretty good job on the product. It was well-received by customers and by analysts and the industry it was gaining a lot of traction, it was well-received by the acquirer. Our investors did really well, but we failed from a cost management perspective. Like it was, it was a disaster. The, the SaaS model worked because Oracle took the, the technology and absorbed the cost of goods sold into their data center. All ah, right. Okay. Yes. So, so we didn't have the AWS issue after yes. the acquisition. So I kind of reflected on that and I started to see, and then I, we, we were in parallel building another company called Cujo that was having very similar cost allocation issues with its customers. And then I saw that problem during COVID, when the early COVID, when the chip uh, crunch came in and there were no computers available to anyone. Mm. And then I realized this cost, this cost problem is systematic in the way the cloud has come up in terms of its adoption. It's not going anywhere. Mm. Um, and so we started CAST based on like a few basic principles of where we thought the industry was going. But that cybersecurity issue that, that that really difficult set time during that attack led to an incredible startup which led to an incredible experience that is now the genesis of our current vision and quest yes so this was a business that was born from true pain that you felt yourself you'd, you'd yes. been through it you'd lived through it 
Yeah. And my CEO would never let me forget that pain, right? Because it yeah. was directly impacting how much money do I need to raise? How do we get our in SaaS gross margin is one of the more important metrics, right? Right yes. up there with churn and customer acquisition costs. Yeah. But like, if you don't have a gross, good gross margin, nothing else works. It, it all, the whole SaaS equation falls apart. And so that's where the, the immense pain was felt. Yes. So this business, did this come about based around Kubernetes? Was that the sort of at the core of what you wanted to be able to do? So cut cloud co costs for clients using Kubernetes technique? So I, I, I looked at the market from a first principles perspective and said, okay, like what, what, what are these, like, cause I was deploying things a certain way, you know, how are customers deploying their applications? Where's the majority of their spend actually occurring? And we, we took a couple of first principles assumptions. The first one was we thought, okay, look, um, we believe that all modernization of software is going to move to the container world. So instead of deploying your jar file or your package directly on a virtual machine or a physical bare metal machine, you're going to deploy these things as container units. If that's true over the next five to seven years, what is the container orchestration platform that everyone is going to gravitate towards? And by that point, Kubernetes was a clear, like if you need to orchestrate these containers and what, what they're called pods in, in Kubernetes, there's a clear winner in the industry. And, and, and that Kubernetes technology was a, originally a Google technology. Just so that somebody who's not familiar with this, or maybe they've just heard the term, explain it in layman's terms. What is Kubernetes and how does it work? Sure. So a container is the basic unit of a really, really small computer footprint. So it has all of the, it has your software that you've, that you've layered into it. And folks may have heard Docker and Docker is the desktop environment that kind of developers use to build these containers and work with them locally, right? So you build an image which contains your software and all of the prerequisites for your software in a really, really small package. So it might only be 50 megabytes as a deployable artifact. Right? And then these artifacts, their life cycle needs to be managed. They need to be spun up. They need to be scaled out. They need health checks. There's all kinds of things that are required to manage these artifacts in production. And so you could try to do that with a simple system like Docker on a bunch of virtual machines, but that doesn't scale. So Kubernetes is the solution for that. And there were a couple of competing standards. There was like a Swarm and others, but it is now the clear winner in the industry. So. Imagine you have thousands of these little container units floating in and you need some orchestration platform to say, are these things okay? Do they need more infrastructure? What nodes am I gonna put them on? Do they interfere with one another? So think of it as the chessboard for the kind of software deployment world of containerization. Right, okay. So why did I choose Kubernetes as kind of the if software is going to be deployed this way and Kubernetes is the kind of clear winner, the third basic principle is we are sorely in need of software engineers and engineers in general, security, software. We have a massive labor shortage or people <clears throat> shortage in our industry. Very true. And that is not going away anytime soon. Uh. It turns out that Kubernetes is a pretty hard platform to manage. You need a lot of cloud native expertise. You need lots of DevOps skills, and those folks are rare unicorns. And if every organization needs a team of these folks to manage their platforms in perpetuity, our thought process is that platform should be autonomous. It shouldn't need humans to operate. And let's build a system that actually removes all of the human intervention from these production environments and let those folks who were previously doing that lower level work rise up their skill set and do more creative things that would then move their businesses forward as opposed to moving it maintaining infrastructure so this that is the, the ai part of cast ai Got that's it. right it is designed to be a fully autonomous system we have kind of three pillars in our full vision of, of autonomous kubernetes mm. the first pillar that we wanted to tackle was the most acute problem that we saw which was cost overruns and massive over allocation of resources in the industry. So we, so CAS is fundamentally takes the position of the auto scaler in these systems and 
orders infrastructure as required to replace the infrastructure that's in the current cluster. So it's a cluster of computers at the lowest possible cost. So rather, so we have two principles, uh, service level objectives for performance and cost. And those are the two axes that we drive infrastructure decisions. And, and Mark, just to give you some perspective, those decisions happen every 15 seconds. There's no human being that can keep up with the level of fluidity that we've introduced into these clusters. They're constantly changing. Yes. And that's a very good thing because we're floating with the cost of what's in the market and with the requirements of the application that's being deployed. Yeah, that's that's an example of where technology is being used to replace where people, not only can they not do it, they wouldn't want to do that sort of job anyway. Can you imagine the pressure on people being able to make those decisions every 15 seconds? You do need a robot. Yeah, like my perspective is, is that any job that is repetitive and we consider grunt work needs mm. to go away. Like, as an example, like, I don't believe in having a separate QA department, like from pure software engineering perspective. Right. I think those folks should just be engineers that are participating in the design and, and building of the software. And everyone should take the burden and responsibility of making sure their code is well testable. Like, yes. so it's testable to begin with and it's fully covered. And yeah. you take pride in your work. Writing a piece of code that's functional without a test case is half a job, in my opinion. Yeah, no, that makes that makes a lot of sense. So one of the things that you're able to do here is, is greatly lower costs, but also prevents downtimes as well. So we do prevent downtimes in very specific situations where customers have, they've already tried to. So let me give you an example, Mark. So like there are these instances in various clouds called spot or preemptible instances. They're offered, they're computers that are offered at a significant discount like 90% discount, like 80% discount, but they come with a no SLA clause, meaning the cloud provider has, to, has the right to take that computer away at any time with different notification windows. AWS has two minutes, Google has 30 seconds, just to give you the kind of context. Wow. So if a customer feels the pressure to leverage these types of heavily discounted computers without automation, they're gonna suffer some downtime. Right? They just, they need their systems to be able to cope with the chaos. And that's why only about 7% of cloud customers ever use these preemptible instances because they're so hard to manage. But if you have a robot doing the work, if you have automation doing the work, oh, we predict that that event is going to happen. We prepare infrastructure in advance. And we have a really great quick case study from this Christmas, the holiday season. We had a customer Prior to using CAST, they would move all their workloads to more stable on-demand instances and pay a lot more money, right. uh, may maybe even order reservations for the holiday season. And then somewhere in January, February, they kind of moved back to spot instances when the market was more readily available. Why is the Christmas season so bad for this? Well, there's a huge amount of demand. AWS doesn't add a lot more supply as an example. So you get what are called droughts and those droughts prevent you from provisioning infrastructure. You get an out of capacity error from the cloud and you have to move on to something else. Mm. So this customer didn't have the ability to kind of automatically switch between on demand and, and spot and manage all the chaos. So they just opted to do the more expensive thing for 20, 30% of the year. Like it was a mm. big chunk of the year. This holiday season, we turned on the full automation for them, and we were able to seamlessly detect those droughts, fall back temporarily. 30 minutes later, when the market recovered, we fell forward back to spot instances and captured the vast majority of the discount that they were looking for with wow. zero downtime. So in effect, yes, the platform does help with by automating uh, specific types of outages, but not all outages. Like, the, the vision for full disaster recovery is the third pillar of the platform that I want to build, where right, customers okay. don't even have to leverage a single cloud. Potentially, if you had a sophisticated enough platform and we got some of these economic barriers out of the way, you could have two cloud providers doing the work. And if one of them suffered an outage, yes, no problem. It, uh, there's a plan that's built into the platform for disaster recovery. So who's your typical customer? And as a second part to that question, what are the, because this tends to be the case, 
what are the points that you need to educate that customer about? Because there, there typically are misunderstandings quite often in some of these newer areas. What are the things that you find are the misunderstandings that you need to address with those customers? So good question. So let me start with the customer profile. So right now we're working with, we happen to be working with a lot of SaaS companies. Why? Because gross margin is an acute problem. But the customer base is evolving to as we grow and as we gain credibility and we get all of our compliances completed, um, like we got SOC 2 just uh, last year, the companies are becoming larger, more sophisticated. There's a bunch of new technology companies in, finance, in the financial space that are, are interested. Uh, we even have some larger legacy like banking operations that are starting to use the technology. So, I don't think it's so much a specific industry, although we did start with kind of software as a service as a core base, mm. uh, is the anyone who's adopted cloud native and specifically Kubernetes is a very good target customer for us. Right. And, and you're absolutely right. There's a lot of misconceptions around Kubernetes itself, what it can do, what the general understanding is. As I said, those engineers are skilled and hard to find. Yes. And, and so you don't get a lot of depth in the bench for a, some of our customers. Some of them, some of them are unbelievable. Like they, they help us drive the roadmap. Others mm. need help in educating themselves on some of these core concepts so that they can leverage all of the capabilities of our platform. Mm. Okay. That's interesting. So when, when did you start cost AI and tell us a little bit about the development of the business? So we started, we started, that's a good question. I think it was 20, 2020. So like just two years. So we've been into it for two years. Okay. You know, Mark, when you're doing this thing, it's like fun every day. Like I completely lose track of time. <laughs> I understand that completely. Yes. <laughs> time is relative, isn't it? According to what you're doing. Sometimes it can pass very quickly. Sometimes it passes slowly. <laughs> I understand that totally. So we kind of got the genesis for this idea and, and then we funded it ourselves, like the founders funded it uh, ourselves with our own personal capital. And we started to do some benchmarking. Like the first thing, the first phase of this was a data analysis exercise to understand how the, re the cloud resources that are available and specifically computers and their associated speeds, how varied are they? and how uniformly are clouds charging for those resources. So we started with a very large data, uh, data science exercise and that took like, three to four months to right. get, get some conclusive results that there was significant arbitrage opportunity just by moving yes. your application from resource A to resource B, you can save a lot of money. Mm. And then we started talking to customers and we focused on Kubernetes very early on based on that hypothesis that it would be easier to create automation for a well-known system with rules that, that have rules of engagement versus just any arbitrary application environment. Um, and then we actually started uh, on the wrong foot. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean. We started with a multi-cloud vision. So we said, look, the, the, the real arbitrage is in between clouds themselves and customers will be sophisticated enough to realize that a single workload, a single application can run distributed in two clouds. I must admit, when I've heard Kubernetes described to me in the past, that's typically where they start from and they talk about the multi-cloud aspect. Very few people ever deploy that way, right? Like That's interesting. Like, like Google Anthos was an attempt to do this as well from a Google perspective. Right. I don't think it was very successful as a product or has yeah. been successful as a product. So we started down this multi cloud journey and we realized a couple of things. Customers were about five years behind us in, that, in our vision. Yeah. And when we started presenting the solution, it was a Kubernetes instance that we would create. We, so we built this product and Mark, remember we talked about spending a bunch of months to build something. And then I think we were short in our build cycle because we were releasing software very, very quickly. Yeah. We could have done a better job of even shrinking down that, that further to get to an answer more quickly. But we really quickly realized we had a couple of big customers say, I love what you're doing, 
in your Kubernetes flavor, especially on the cost optimization and allocation side. Um, I am nowhere close to using multiple clouds. So this whole multi-cloud feature is not useful to me. Mm -hmm. And why can't you do what you're doing inside my Kubernetes instance that I've basically, look guys, I don't trust you. Mr. Customer doesn't trust me to run Kubernetes on their behalf. They do trust the cloud environment, AWS. Yes. Uh, Azure. So why don't you guys do what your value, your core value is just inside our environment? Yeah. There was a eure eureka moment there. Like, yeah, we overbuilt a little bit. Let's take the amazing parts of this and apply it to existing cluster technology that exists in the market today. I, I think that talks to one other element when you're looking at creating a new solution, you identify one of them, where's the pain, understanding that pain. For me, then it is a case of looking at priorities. It is a pain, it's one we can solve, but is it ever going to rise to a level where the customer is going to take action? Because it could be a pain, you could provide the solution, but there's gonna be many more things in the organization that are more important. And then the next one is, is the market ready for it now? Because it sounds as though you were ahead of the market. And when yeah. the market isn't ready, it can be a very difficult place to be. You're gonna be in the desert with very few other people to talk to. Yeah, it's being early is just as bad or worse than being late. Yes. Like, at least when you're late, there's a validated market, right? Like you've got there competitors, is. you yeah. can compete on price, you can compete and, on all Yeah, and there's always late comers and the tail of the market always goes on a lot longer than is predicted, always. I've never seen yeah. any difference to that. But if you're yeah. too early, it can be a really tough place. So, yeah, so about a year and a half ago, we pivoted to saying, okay, let's focus our technology just on existing Kubernetes clusters. So today a customer with an existing cluster and any of the major clouds can come and attach it and they get within a few minutes, they get this read only savings report that tells them all of the things that we would do differently if we were running the infrastructure. And it shows them a dollar savings. Like you are spending $10,000 a month right now on your cluster, it should be $4,500. So you can do this do within, within minutes? Mm -hmm. We do it within minutes. Wow, that's that's so, interesting. So some of the analysis like uh, for seasonality takes longer, sure. but there are some low hanging fruit analysis that we do like, like a bin packing analysis, like your applications are spread over 30 computers or 30 servers. Yes. We can actually bin pack that into 10 and we can bin pack that into 10 of this type of shape, this heterogeneous shape. And that by itself is a savings of X. Then if we move you to different instance types, that's a savings of Y. So uh, we, there's a lot we can apply immediately. I, I love that because that, that's going through the stage right at the beginning of examination, looking at the specific situation of that specific client and providing valuable information rather than what a lot of software companies do is as soon as possible straight into demo. This is what we have. And it's not what we're probably going to give to you, but this is our software and we love it and we're convinced by it, which never yeah. seems to work for me. So I, I, I love that. And that your ability to be able to do that, I think that's really valuable. So, and here's my vision for the, for how we're building the moat. And, you know, I, I, I guess like exposing our moat, which folks are like, you know, the, 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 the thing that prevents kind of competitive pressure. Sure. I, I'm okay with it. Like, you know, the best, martial artists will tell you how they're going to beat you and you know still do it still <laughs> you, you know it's coming but it's, so i'm okay with like kind of sharing my thoughts here but the, for me the mode is data so like when you when we install our agent into a customer environment that agent is reporting back every 15 seconds and then we have thousands of customers even the ones that aren't paying us any money these guys are streaming extremely valuable data to us and we're providing value to them in return. What's that value? That value is a ongoing savings report. And you can get that email to you once a week. So Monday morning, the DevOps manager comes in, has an email saying, these are, you know, this is what your savings could be. And then our plan is to extend that in our next version to cybersecurity, cost allocation, which teams are spending the most money. So there's a lot of depth that we're going into now. Once you have that email report that becomes very valuable, you should start sharing it within the organization. 
And that's kind of our brand building exercise. But like once you've got our agent installed and you're, and you're getting all of this free and amazing reporting in a SaaS model where you're not spending any of the money to generate or, or maintain the data, then we feel that we've got a really nice hook. And then it's about conversion of which customers are ready for going from passive, listening to our report, flip the switch and go into active management and start saving within hours. That's another great opportunity for you is being able to make that change within hours rather than talking about them to about months, which is, yeah. is fantastic. And typically, I mean, what are the sort of savings that they're like to see 10, 20, 30%? And I know it's going to vary according to their circumstances and their usage, but give me a feel for the range. So the very, very best customers that have an optimization team in place that already have what's called a FinOps practice will often get 10, 15% off the bat and then work with them to improve because there's many things that will take some effort, but with small changes, they can see a long tail of improvements. Yep. If you get somebody who is shocked by their costs, maybe they're growing super quickly, a startup that's growing, often we're, we're shaving 80% like within wow. a couple of hours and wow. then people like step away and it, it's kind of like a why didn't i do this sooner like a big part of our kind of closing pitch is look you can spend a month deciding but like that's a month of just wasted cash right yes and and there's an interesting phenomena financial and economic phenomena that we're trying to battle here which is the cloud providers want to lock you in like like any good monopolistic behaving business yes. in capital society, I want to have my customers locked in. I don't want them going anywhere. So they do that a few ways. One of them is data gravity, which I'll talk to you about in just a second, right? Which I'm very passionate about. And I think is probably the, the most egregious practice that these clouds have. So da data gravity, making sure that your data can't leave the cloud environment. The second one is contractual. So, you know, what's the promise of cloud? I can come to a cloud, put my credit card down, start using. When I don't need it anymore, I shut everything down. I don't get charged the next month. That beautiful on-demand pay-as-you-go model, right? So, but what customers are saying is, look, I'm, this is extremely expensive. Mr. Cloud Provider, what do I do? And their answer is, oh, no problem. We have a long-term commitment plan for you. You can commit to one year. You can commit to three years. You can pay 60% down. So what is all the net effect of these reserve prices or savings plans is, is that now I'm locked in not only data from a data perspective, I'm locked in contractually. Wow. And I, now I feel like I have to stay with these guys because I have sunken costs. And our goal, our kind of uh, unwritten goal here is to get our customers to reduce their reservations every single month, all the way down to zero when they get back to the on-demand fluid model, still saving all the money, but they don't have that three-year overhang commitment. Got it. I mean, that's a technique that was used by the paper record storage management industry when there were boxes that they were storing off site in the early days of this contract. And a lot of those companies were actually making more money when all of the boxes were retrieved, taken out of that, because of that clause that they had in the agreement. But over a period of time, the users became more educated into that and i can yeah. see also with actually tying somebody into a contract with the offer of a discount yeah interesting yeah three three primary lock-in mechanisms for the folks that at aws google azure etc one is contractual we understand that the, the other one is charging a, no money to bring your data but charging lots of money to extract your data yeah so Send us as much as you want. We'll even send you an appliance that you can load it all onto free of charge. Yeah. When you want to extract your data, list price starts at about nine cents per gigabyte. And Mark, you might say, hey, nine cents per gigabyte, that's pretty good. You know, like I my, my mobile data plan, it's probably a lot more than that per gigabyte, right? And yes, for a consumer, nine cents a gigabyte is good. Just to give you some perspective, from a cost model, like, because, you know, in being in the data center business, you kind of understand costs. Sure. It's about a 30X markup, 30X, not 80% oh. margin, not 70% <laughs> margin, 30 <laughs> times costs. Yeah. So something that costs AWS 75 cents, they're effectively charging 30 bucks for. 
And why do they do that? It's not that they need the gross margin. It's a lock-in effect, right? Like it's yeah. very expensive to move tens of terabytes of data all of the time. It's just, a, it's a deal breaker. And the third mechanism is proprietary technology, proprietary APIs. So like a customer that signs up for DynamoDB, which is a data, a key value store in AWS, has a much harder time moving than if they're using vanilla Postgres or MySQL or even Oracle. And, you know, so these proprietary control planes, data planes that, that these cloud providers offer are in a sense a form of lock-in as well. Yeah. You mentioned that the the sort of the third pillar that you're working on is full um, auto recovery. What are you going to be doing? What's the, the bigger vision, the long-term vision with Cast AI? Where do you want to take this business and what do you want to do with it? So first of all, I think the total addressable market for Cast is the entire side, size of the cloud. Not the entire thing, because every single person that is going to be deploying software will be, and if they're using containers, and we assume they will be, will have a reason to have an autonomous Kubernetes cluster. Do you think you so, ought to expand your, your vision a little bit more? It's a bit minimalist. <laughs> no, I think the entire fine. cloud industry. <laughs> That's pretty big. <laughs> and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the and the and the three core pillars are cost and performance, cybersecurity, and autonomous recovery. Like those are yeah. and and those will all just be turn on features because once you've integrated once, once you've done the security review once, which is a major hurdle for larger orgs, once you've gotten your staff trained, it's very easy for an engineering team to say, oh, let's turn on the security feature set. Let's test it out. And, and so our strategy is to land and extend. We might start with a customer with cost, but we hope that they'll be using all of our capabilities of an autonomous platform in the future. So I, I really don't look at it as a cost tool in the, in, the, in the fullness of time. It's really an autonomous operating platform. Yeah. No, it, it sounds it sounds a really good, strong three pillars. I can see how that can be very will be very attractive. So you've been in the software industry. Final question for you: What are the key things that you've learned overall in all of the companies that you've worked at? What are the sort of the key lessons? If you wanted to pass across some wisdom, knowledge, and experience to perhaps people who are listening. What are the things that really stand out in your mind that you've learned from your own personal experience? So I think uh, the first one we kind of talked about, which is fail fast, fail often, and don't yeah. have ego about it. Like it's going to happen. There's no human that's going to come up with a business plan and just execute on that from day one. And, and it'll exactly turn out as you envisioned in the garage. It just doesn't happen. Right. So Gosh. don't, that failure, failing and having a plan of how to move next is extremely important. And you do that, you recognize your failures early through customer feedback, right? So by testing, by getting, and the contracts start really small. Like you might start with a hundred dollar a month customer and that's cool. Mm. Just start, like that's the important thing. Start with someone who's willing to pay you for the value you get and you will figure out how to grow. Mm. Um, so that's kind of, Thing number one. The second one is a little bit less orthodox and it's from a delivery perspective. And it's what I kind of focus on engineering happiness. Like, so we're competing for these very difficult to find resources, right? These are highly skilled individuals. Yes. And uh, a lot of folks, in, they might be considered cogs in the wheel in larger organizations. I really look at software engineers as artists and their overall happiness directly impacts the quality of work that they do. So mm. I spend a lot of time and energy as a CTO, making sure that our dev environment is a pleasure to work with, that the type of coding that we do is really fun to do and fast. And I give my engineers a lot of agency, right? They have full control of the stack and I trust them to do their job. And part of that happiness is the you know, fulfilling work that people want to do. And part of it is being recognized for a job well done mm. and being, being hard on, 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 on the bar when a job is not well done. So sure. I, I, I believe that, you know, engineering teams and other teams in companies, marketing and sales, they're all partners in the business and they deserve to share in that upside. And that's where I think 
equity ownership in a company is extremely important across the board. So I, I would say it's, there's a product set of learnings, there's an engineering happiness set of learnings, and then part of that engineering happiness piece is giving those engineers autonomy and agency to drive the platform forward and trusting them because just, you hired the best people you can hire. Yes. Hopefully they're smarter than you. Let yeah. them run. Don't get in their way. Don't get in their way. Yeah, I've seen that a lot. Brilliant. Well done, Leon, today. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. It's the first time that I've had somebody on with a business exactly like yours. I think that there could be a lot of people that listen to this podcast that potentially could have a, an interest in using your service. So if somebody wants to get hold of you, have a chat about what you're doing, what's the best way to reach you? You can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Just search for Leon Cooperman, uh, K-U-P-E-R-M-A-N. Um, but if you come to path.ai, that you're two clicks away, single sign on, and then you're two clicks away from installing that free agent and just get your report without talking to a sales guy or any human being, get your report and see what waste you have in your environment. I think it's going to blow a lot of people's minds when they see it the first time. It's, you know, it's a little bit unbelievable. And then, and then give us a call. We'll walk you through it. We'll show you how to do it safely. Uh, not to not to risk anything in your prod environments. Um, and that's probably the, the most value that I can give folks that are running these types of uh, computing environments. Superb. Great respect to you today, Leon. I think you've delivered a lot of value in this podcast. And um, it was a very easy podcast to do. So I've enjoyed talking to you. I hope we would keep in contact. And uh, thank you for spending the time with me today. Thank you, Mark. Great questions. Really appreciate the, uh, the thoughts. So that was the Bossy Podcast. Please get in touch. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please reach out to me. If you've got ideas for a podcast, then again, reach out to me. And if there's something you don't like, tell me again. I want to hear. Thank you very much for your time. 